Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, th this is the Liberty Mastermind Symposium, and I, I kind of asked uh, the guy, I said, uh, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he says, well, anything about liberty. And uh, I kind of knew that this would be more of, uh, there'd be many more speeches themed around economics, silver, gold, and, and, and stuff like that because of all the, the speakers and our sponsors. Uh, but I decided to go the bit more philosophical and esoteric route and uh, come up with this presentation, The uh, Benefits of a Truly Free Mind. And uh, it is still liberty. It's still under the domain of liberty. Uh, so hopefully uh, you do like it. Now, um, this is not to say that uh, most of you here are, are not independent-minded or do not have free minds. Most of you are, just by the fact you are here. But I wanted to approach the idea of a free mind in a completely different angle uh, to give us all a different uh, viewpoint or vantage point of a free mind, independent thought, independent thinking, and how it could play a role in not just increasing the liberty of our lives, but it, it help us enjoy our lives a lot better. So Now, we have the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell. No one's going to contest that. That's uh, we'll, we'll all go along with that premise. But I genuinely and sincerely contend that there is a sixth sense, and that is mental stimulation. Now, uh, we're not going to debate... <clears throat> you know, is it really a sense or whatnot? But my goal here is to prove to you that mental stimulation, your brain, uh, does at least have some qualities and characteristics of a sense. And uh, like your other senses, it, it does play a role in the amount of pain or pleasure it will deliver in your life. Now, to prove that to you or to at least convince you of it, I'm going to do this in uh, two ways. First, we have squirrels. So we have a little squirrel here. Squirrels, for the most part, or at least my thinking takes me, the the extent of their mental stimulation or their philosophizing or their uh, theorizing comes uh, down to these three things. Boy, I'd like to climb that tree over there. Uh, boy, I'd like to have an acorn. And uh, shucks howdy, I sure would like to have sex with that bushy-tailed girl squirrel over there. Uh, these are, as far as I can tell again, the uh, the uh, about the extent of you know, theorizing and thinking and mental stimulation squirrels have. Squirrels, unlike humans, do not, you know, contemplate is there going to be ramifications for American involvement in Syria. Uh, they don't ponder whether or not there's a heaven or hell and, you know, should should I be uh, a, a, a Machiavellian? Should I be a hedonist or should I be a bit more altruistic? Uh, and they don't debate different uh, economic systems, right? Humans do. Uh, animals, they don't have this capacity, they don't, they, they, and it's, it's evidenced by the fact that there is no language. I know some, you know, Jane out in the jungle gorilla watcher would contend, you know, contend well, they have a language, and, and, and dolphins snort or whatever, uh, but for the most part, they, since animals do not have a language, they cannot convey concepts, theories, ideas, and therefore respond to that. It, it is very basic and Darwinistic in nature in terms of just being able to survive and procreate. Right? Now, if this doesn't convince you, this will. Because all senses will cause one or two things. They will either cause pleasure or pain. So if you want pleasure, you eat ice cream. If you want pain, you eat Brussels sprouts. Right? Now, uh, I'm go not because I'm a sadist, but I'm going to cause you all a tremendous amount of pain by having you watch this. Leave that there. Peggy Joseph took her daughter out of school early Wednesday for this. Her emotions ran high following Obama's speech. It was the most memorable time of my life. I, I, it was a touching moment because I never thought this day would ever happen. I won't have to worry about putting gas in my car. I won't have to worry about paying my mortgage. You know, if I, if I help him, he's going to help me. Right, okay, so now how many of you are in absolute breathing pain? <laughs> Correct. All right, now, again, if my, my, argue, my point of being here today is not to argue whether or not mental stimulation is an actual sixth sense. However, it's not deniable that it is there. It will have an effect on the quality of your life. And I argue that just like every other sense, it should be stimulated positively. You should, you should stimulate your uh, uh, mentality. You should stimulate your thought. Uh, you, you should treat it just like you would your body, working out, eating right, 
uh, because that will not only improve your life, but I uh, contend, uh, not today, but uh, I argue, that mental stimulation is actually the key to happiness in life. Right? Now, <clears throat> the key to maximizing the mental stimulation and therefore maximizing the benefit and joy and happiness and liberty that you will derive out of life is to have a truly free mind. Okay? Uh, you, your brain will go down different lines of thoughts. You will, you will come up with uh, uh, new ideas, new concepts. You'll just be a much more interesting person. Now, how do you attain a free mind? Well, I didn't want to do this, but after thinking about it, I, I came up, well, there's four general steps, and I don't mean to sound like an academian who, who just never set foot in, in the real world. Well, there's four steps to achieving happiness, according to my psychology. So these are just the general four steps uh, that I've come up with. <clears throat> First, you must achieve independence and individual, you mu individualism. You must realize and appreciate the fact that you are a unique pe a person. You are sentient. You you have this one shot at life. You have a right to this life, and you have the right to spend it however you want. So, in other words, you know, my dad was a pastor. Uh, no, dad, I'm not going to become a Christian, or I'm not going to become a Jew, or I'm not going to become a Muslim. No, I'm not going to wear the burqa. Or a lot of people say, well, you should become a dentist, like your father and his father before him. No, dad, I'm not going to become a dentist. I'm going to become a cartoonist or uh, uh, something like that. Whatever it is, you realize that you are your own person and you, you, know, you only got one life. You're going to die. You say, hey, you know what? I am going to lead it this way. I have the, the at minimum, I have this right to independence and independent thought. The fact, second thing is individualism urged through acknowledging death. <laughs> and what I mean by this is, is basically... Uh, a lot of people will say they're independent and, and they, they're not going to disagree with the previous slide. They're going to say, yes, I have the right to my own self, da, 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 da. But they never capitalize on it. And this is where I think having a near-death experience is a good thing because it wakes you up. It slaps you across the face and says, hey, you dumbass, you, you're going to die soon. And, and by soon, 40, 50 years, that's soon. You could get hit by a truck. Tomorrow, you could you could have slipped off that uh, uh, cliff you were climbing the other day and not accidentally grabbed onto that rock. And many of us have had experiences where we we could have died. Uh, we were just it was just luck that we didn't. And I think that having these near death experiences, or at least acknowledging the fact that you are finite, lights a little fire under your ass to make you go out and and capitalize on this life that you've been given. <clears throat> the next thing is that once you realize, hey, I got to pack it in because I'm going to die in 40, 50, 60 short years, is you must actually go and do interesting things. Uh, it's one thing to sit and read all the books in the world, and I've met many interesting people who, who are, are, are very free-minded, independent-minded people who, who just read, but I think that, that's not enough. I think you need to actually go out and do interesting things with your life. Right? The average man in Western civilization, this is the average man right here. Hey, man, we cheered for the Vikings, man. We did it all the way. We, they could have done it with it. They live vicariously through other people who, frankly, don't give two shits about them. All right, I know it's Vancouver. I mentioned the, the Vikings by live in the Twin Cities. But pick whatever uh, professional sports team. Uh, this is proof positive of the stereotypical, I mean, I'm generalizing, stereotypical American male who has nothing going on in his life and their, their peak, their pinnacle. Look at how happy these losers are because some guy threw a sphere through a hoop or some guy swung a stick at a smaller sphere and hit it over a fence or some guy took a, took a, a stick with a fat end on it and hit a, a, a little flat cylinder through a net. All right? that, that shows you just how common... Uh, and boring the average man is. And <clears throat> let's not be sexist. Ladies are probably worse because <laughs> we don't have the equivalent of the view. What what triggers women to watch this bullshit? I have no idea. But it's this is you know why The View and Good Morning America and all these crap daytime shows are. It's because the vast majority of people are boring. They they, they just they don't do interesting things. Their lives are are literally wasted. All right. Or here's the other thing you can do. How about this guy, right? The world's most interesting man, right? The world's most interesting. Of course, he's he's uh, a fictitious character, but he he would be the ideal or the goal or your personal variation of it. This man does not sit around cheering for teams to win. This man does not watch Oprah. 
This man is too busy out doing things with his life, right? And he has, therefore, a much more interesting life. He has a much more independent mind. He, you know, he is so independent-minded, he bowls overhand. So, <laughs> but again, who would you rather be? The frat boy douchebag going and cheering on some professional sports team, the average American 32-year-old woman who stay, you know, watches the, the, the vermin of the world, or do you want to be the world's most interesting man? Now, after you do that, <clears throat> the battle is not over because you have to maintain your independence and individualism. Understand society hates. They loathe the independent-minded person. All right? they, a society is also geared to be for the masses. It not, not undemocratically so, not illogically so. It should be uh, designed for the vast majority of people. That, that makes the most sense. But it is hard because you are in an environment that is not conducive to the independent individual, either because of backlash from society or because society itself is geared not to... Like, for example, I I stay up very late. I want a Chipotle fajita at 3 a.m. Well, unfortunately, the critical mass of people are not up at 3 a.m. to have Chipotle be open. It's, it's not worth their time. Uh, it's a, that's a minor, I mean, that you know, I'll live, I'll survive without having Chipotle open at 3 a.m. But you get the idea. The, in, the, the truly independent-minded people, uh, uh, society is not geared around such a, a small minority. Regardless, you do these things, you will be unique, your life will not be wasted, you are going to be smarter than most. I don't believe in, you know, well, you're born with a certain amount of intelligence. Eh, yeah, but you can you can definitely uh, change that, and especially by going and doing interesting things. You're going to have a truly free mind. You're going to have perspective and experiences and, and have context and, and vantage points that other people have not had. You will maximize your mental stimulation. And above all else, you'll have no regrets in life. You are not going to be lying there on your deathbed saying, I wish I went to Alaska. Gah! You know, I wish I chased after that redhead with the big boobs. Gah! And then you're dead and it's too, it's over. No, you did chase after the girl with the redhead with the big boobs. You did go out to Alaska. You did write that book. You did whatever it is that you wanted to do. Right? In other words, you will be the world's most interesting man. Whatever variation that may be. Now, the benefits of a truly free mind... The benefits are truthfully limitless, um, but I just wanted to go over some of, of the key ones here to show you the fruits of the dividends that having a, a much freer mind has. Uh, first, you're going to have a better life. Uh, your life is not going to be common. It, it will not be wasted. You you will go and do whatever's of interest to you. It may not be of interest to everybody else, but your your independence, your 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 essentialness, your one time on this planet will not be wasted. You are going to go... And, and stimulate that brain and have such a, a superior life to, to the vast majority of other people uh, that it won't even be uh, comparable. Right? You're going to have a better career. Uh, this is, a lot of people say, really? Well, technically you're not even going to have a career. Whatever it is that you land into a career is going to have to fit with your personality. And, and what I mean by that is truly independent-minded people do not make great employees. Because the current labor market, corporate America, current employers are not conducive to the independent-minded person. They're just not. They're they're not conducive to leaders, thinkers, innovators, or creators. Right. So you're gonna and this is like a baptism by fire. You're gonna get your ass fired, like at least three or four times. You're never gonna have that that great career right off the bat, and it's going to force you to find very quickly because you got to put food on the table, what you are conducive at what you are a lot of people a lot of the sheeple they can suffer they can tolerate that hour commute one way the hour commute back and nine hours of complete mind-numbing bullshit in their cubicle uh, they can do it you won't be able to is there going to be a drawback to that yes you're not going to have reliable employment <clears throat> you're going to have to you know starve and strive and suffer a little bit but when you do find that job or you do find that career or you do find that calling Whatever it is, it's going to be a better career than any corporate lawyer, than any high high ranking CFO, than any uh, a, a high level computer networker. Whatever it is, you're you're going to it's going to be conducive. In other words, it's actually putting the cart before the horse. The job has to fit your personality because you're not budging. You're not you're not capable of change because you are that independent minded, and so your job in turn will be mentally stimulating, rewarding, and not just this nine-to-five corporate cog type of position.
Right? Somewhat related, uh, you're going to have better vision. <clears throat> And therefore, you're going to be able to capitalize on opportunities. And so, for example, we have a, a, a lot of uh, innovators and, and, and uh, captains of industry here. we got Steve Jobs, uh, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Mikhail Kalashnikov, uh, uh, um, Howard Hughes, Bill Gates, all them. Uh, these people, heck, I don't even think any of them graduated from college. I don't think any of them went. I, I, some went, but I don't think they, any of them graduated. Uh, these people were not your 9 to 5 corporate cocks. These were visionaries. These were people who thought outside of the box. And since they also had an entrepreneurial strength in, uh, in them, they were able to essentially turn themselves into billionaires, or at least famous people. Right? So uh, the independent-minded uh, person is going to uh, definitely uh, have more uh, entrepreneurial opportunities uh, because they, they, they have the ability to think outside of that box. If you're not of the entrepreneurial mind, because I, I do believe it's a separate mindset, though they might be related, uh, you're also going to have a better vision when it comes to identifying threats. And uh, what I get a kick out of this is people ask me, well, how'd you know the housing bubble is going to crash? Or how'd you know the, the dot coms? Or how'd you know about the education? I mean, what was there? What gave it away, man? And I'd like to say it was brilliance. I'd like to say that it was genius, but I actually honestly think that it was just uh, being independent-minded, all right? Now, if you look at the people, though, who warned about the housing bubble, using the housing bubble as an example, they were brilliant economists. In retrospect, you look at these, they're brilliant economists. Economists like Schiller, Schiff, Rubini, and this handsome devil right here. <laughs> but, but once again, I don't... Are these guys smarter than average? You, yes, certainly. Are we better looking than? Of course we are. But are we geniuses? Are we are we are we truly brilliant men and women that 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 saw warned about the dot com or the housing bubble? No, we just dared to think outside of the box. Right? Also, uh, being independent minded and having a free mind, you're going to be a much more interesting person. Right? People are going to uh, uh, want to talk to you. You're going to you walk into the room. Who do you want to talk to? Mortimer Snerd, the CPA, not to be against CPAs or accounts, I love them. Or do you want to talk to the world's most interesting man? Do you want to hear about the guy that, that went to Tanzania and uh, helped free the you know Uzuzu tribe from the Igigi tribe or whatever the world's most interesting man does? Right? You're, you're, and by, de by default, you're going to be much more attractive to the opposite sex. Take two average-looking men or women and make one very interesting and charismatic and have worldly experiences and make the other one just your average run-of-the-mill Joe, uh, every time they're going to go for the guy that's more, or the gal that's more interesting. Also closely related, you're going to have better conversation because you have different thoughts. Maybe not even different, but just unique thoughts. Thoughts people have never heard of. Um, thoughts people have never thought of. Experiences people have never and probably never will experience you are going to be a better conversationalist. Also, you're going to find other people who are also much more interesting and better conversationalists themselves. You will seek out other interesting people. And as I've gotten older, I've started to appreciate um, the, the benefits of conversation because I think conversation is probably the most enjoyable thing. Uh, I used to, you know, I, not that I don't like video games anymore. I love video games and I love hiking. And I love all that, but nothing as I've aged do I appreciate now more than having good quality conversation with interesting, not even necessarily intelligent, just interesting people? Um, and, and that right there as, as you converse, because once again, this gets back to the squirrel. Squirrels can't talk. Humans can. We can converse with language. And that's how we interact and stimulate one's mind and, 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 and increase the, the, the quality of life is through having conversation with other people. Right? Also, again, closely related, you're just going to have better people in your life. And you being a much more interesting, much more engaging, and, and just overall higher quality person, you are going to have higher quality friends. You're going to seek out higher quality mates. Uh, your children are going to be grown up and brought under your tutelage, and they're not your... I guarantee you, the average person here is not going to, oh yeah, drop our kid off a day, carry out, okay, take care. You, I guarantee you, you are more engaged and involved, or you were more engaged and involved for the kids that have moved out of the house teaching your children life lessons, giving them wisdom, passing them on wisdom, and making sure that you enjoy their time while they're, they were still there. Uh, and the reason why is that humans are the most important thing in life. Uh, you could take a look, uh, you know, and this, here, 
this, this is where a free mind will lead you. You will figure out what is the most important thing in life, and that is other human beings. I've said this before. You could have the most advanced Xbox video game system ever with all the video games in the world. No matter how complex and advanced that system is, it is still finite. It is still programmed by other human beings. The only thing that is truly infinite in its di and, and is dynamic, that will not act the same way, that is not a robot, not an automaton, is other human beings. And when you interact with them uh, in your social or romantic life, your friends, your family, your loved ones, uh, in you being a much more interesting person, you will surround yourself by higher quality, much more interesting and important things in life, and that is other human beings. So your life is, is infinitely improved uh, by having a freer mind that way. Now, <clears throat> just as there are benefits to having a free mind, there are enemies and drawbacks of uh, a free mind. <clears throat> I mentioned or I uh, touched on this before. Society hates the independent-minded person. You are not obeying. You are not. I mean, I a great example. I can't. I'm not claiming to understand this. I have a theory, but but just let me show you an example. Um, I wrote a post about why I had a vasectomy. I don't want kids. I don't. I don't. I can't. I can barely support myself half the time. I can't bring a kid into this world. All right. And, and on top of it, what's the kid gonna do? Become a, a slave, a battery for future generations of parasites who just go live off the government dole? Uh, I have very good reasons not to have kids. But the response, and the I shouldn't say the the overall the overall response was positive. But there was at least I'd say a quarter of the responses were vehemently angry and negative like how dare you not have kids how dare you're selfish you're greedy it's like what the hell's business is it of yours why how is this affecting you and like I said I don't claim to know why this is but in general the reason why I, I think that there's such a negative response by a, a group of people to the independent-minded people is that you are empirical proof in front of their face that they may have wasted their lives or made a decision that was wrong and wasted a part of their lives. For example, if you get, you know, Grandma Tilly, 75 years old, and she's a good Christian, she's got her Bible, and you argue or make the point that, yeah, I don't believe, yeah, I don't think that, you know, there's a heaven or a hell, and, and maybe there's a God or whatever, but, you know, so far you got nothing. You got a book, and the Muslims say that they're right, and the Jews say that they're right, and the Buddhists say that they're right, and I ain't seen any empirical evidence that prove and show me the empirical evidence, I'll subscribe up right away, but you're going to, well, you're going to burn in hell! You're going to burn in hell! And they get very emotional about it. Well, the reason why is that Tilly doesn't want to face the fact that she might have wasted and pissed away 75 years worth of Sundays, not to mention how much ever time donating time to the church and tithing and, and stuff like that. Uh, same thing, you know, the person who does not have kids and drives around on the motorcycle and enjoys life and <clears throat> goes to South Dakota and, uh, does, and has sushi and cigars all the time, uh, that's empirical proof that there may have been a better choice. Uh, for someone who's weighed down by four kids from five different fathers or five different mothers. But uh, regardless, uh, the person going out there striking it on his or her own is going to have at least this group of people that are, I would say envious, maybe I don't know what, but they, for whatever reason, uh, they do not like you and they will try to shame you. Uh, 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 for daring to be and living an independent life. Uh, closely related to this, though, uh, you, you have to understand, I'm, I'm going to simplify this a lot. Uh, basically, the entire history of politics throughout the world can be summarized into two groups. There are producers and parasites. There are people that produce the wealth, and then there are parasites that live off of that wealth. Right? It's human nature to get by. If you could get something for nothing, you'll do it. And usually when you have the parasites, or at least the parasitic political group, whether you, know, you could call it the Democrats or the Socialists or the Labor Party, whatever you want to call them, they have to, because they're, they're, the, the nature of their political ideology is parasitic and not sustainable, they have to come up with outright lies in the form of propaganda uh, to rationalize or excuse or hide or shield the fact that it's parasitical. 
all right? And today we have that in, in various forms like today. We have politically correct. You can't dare point out something that's true. You can't point out that the emperor has no clothes. There's white privilege. You know, there you have your uh, your racism aspect. You have patriarchy. You have your sexism aspect. You have un unfairly benefited. You have your, um, your class warfare. Uh, but then also don't think it's always designed to be slamming on rich white males. Uh, every group, it doesn't matter what class or ethnic group or whatever, every group throughout the history of the world has it. So like today, you know, you have Uncle Toms, you have Oreos, you have acting white, you have off the reservations. Whatever form this propaganda and brainwashing and political correctness comes in, uh, it's all enemies to a free mind. And they will try to shame you. And some, in the history, sometimes they'll, uh, they'll try to litigate or uh, criminalize you. Uh, you know, in which cases some of that has, if you dare speak about anything, even not even politically related. I mean, you wanna you wanna uh, catch hell? Just say men don't like fat chicks. You know, it's true. Just say we don't like fat chicks. But oh my goodness, the, the I mean, then they come out of the woodwork with fangs and claws drawn, and uh, but you 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 get the idea is that there is. A huge political, especially if you want to speak truthfully and bluntly about economics, politics, how society advances, there is always going to be that parasitic political group that will come out and attack you and villainize you for that. Sometimes this attacking takes on violence. And sometimes, you know, people, many people have been killed. I have Galileo up here just as an example. He wasn't killed, but he was put under house arrest for daring to suggest a heliocentric uh, uh, a galaxy, not galaxy, um, solar system, saying that the Earth rotated around the sun. Well, if that was the case, then this, then the Earth was not the center of the universe, and the Pope wasn't the center of the universe, and what was on the sun? And oh my God! And, and then they, okay, off, off to uh, house arrest. You go for the rest of your life. Uh, so you can. Th one of the risks of having a truly free mind and speaking candidly and bluntly and just truthfully is that uh, the political forces that may be may say, you know what, you're too free-minded. You're, you're, you're a threat to the power structure. We are going to arrest you or just plain kill you. Okay. Another drawback is peerlessness. And it's not a word. That's why the little red squeaking line, because Microsoft is saying, hey, that's not a real word, man. You can't use it. But I'm going to be a rebel and use peerlessness anyway. Uh, and what well, would you like to see some pictures from South Dakota? Okay, all right, all right. So here's Van Acker Canyon. Okay, and uh, here's some buffalo, and then uh, that's Lake Pactola, and there's the Badlands. I think that's the only picture. Right, okay. What do you notice about those pictures? Yeah, 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 there's, there's no one in them. And the reason no one is in them is because I'm the one taking the picture, and for whatever reason... Um, it's 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 early June when these were taken. I guess a lot of people are still going to school, or uh, it's not quite tour season yet. But I was out there and alone by myself. I had no peers. Now I don't mean this to sound like bragging or anything like that. But how many people do you know can just leave at a drop of a hat, take two weeks off, that have the time and the money to do so, and because they can work from the laptop or off the internet? Yeah, exactly. If I had my friends or if I had like unlimited funds, I would pay my friends to stop working so they could come out to these areas and come play with me. Uh, but sadly, that's that's not how it works. I'm not this rich super billionaire. Uh, so if, you know, not to, I'm just using myself as an example, but whatever endeavor you decide to choose, you decide to become a great pianist, you decide to become a great carpenter, you decide um, to whatever it is that you're of interest, become a great brewmaster, whatever, raise wiener dogs, whatever you want to do, you'll get to the point that you'll be the only wiener dog raising guitarist. And you won't really have a lot of people to talk to you in those regards, in that particular field. All right? How, you know, think about the world's most interesting man. Yeah, he's got a lot of girls hovering around him, but does he have a peer? Does he have someone to talk to? Can he have someone that is able to associate with him what it's like canoeing out of a C-135 uh, parachuting out of it from the sky into the water? No, of course, because he's peerless. He doesn't have any peers. So there's an element of loneliness here. Now, I also throw up uh, this because uh, it doesn't have to be physical activity, but you're, you're going to run into it in intellectual uh, capacities. Again, society is not geared for the individual. 
And if you take a look at these two very independent-minded men, uh, we have Walter E. Williams and Thomas Sawwell. Both economists, both very conservative, but they also happen to both be black. Can you imagine what it was like for them? You know, they weren't out in Alaska. They weren't out and it's, it's not an issue for them of taking off two weeks' time and having the funds. For them, it's like, could you imagine what kind of a hostile environment they grew up in if they dared to espouse a, a, a conservative economic thought within the black community? And how they became economists, doctorate in economists. Do you, do you realize what kind of an uphill battle or at least what some kind of backlash they had? And you know now with the internet, thank God you can you can meet people and discuss. But uh, again, a real world example of peerlessness. Oops, where do we go here? Da, 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 da. Sorry. All right. Finally, <clears throat> you are going to be your own worst enemy when it comes to uh, having a truly free mind. All right. Uh, we don't live in North Korea. We don't live in uh, the Soviet Union. We are a relatively free nation. You, you at, li at minimum, you can have your thoughts. All right? But I really believe the human mind is uh, predisposed to complacency. Uh, if, if you look at us in terms of evolution, uh, it, 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 until recently in human history, uh, we did not have unlimited food. We did not have transportation. We didn't have such luxuries. And like animals, in a very much similar regard, the majority of our effort had to go into survival. So you're genetically not wired to go and then philosophize and think and try all these new adventures and things like that. Once you got your food, you're, we're a lot like dogs. You know, if you leave a vat of food on the ground for the dog, the dog will eat it until it's puking and it's dead. And then it'll eat it some more. Because the dog is like, I gotta survive, I gotta survive, I gotta survive. Who knows when this vat of food will ever come again? They don't learn. You could, you could always have it. They, they don't, they think the food is, is lit. But humans are the same way. So your brain will shut down. It will go into conservative mode. It will sit and veg out because it needs to save the energy to go and chase the mammoth tomorrow or, or tend the crops or whatever it is in our hind uh, Neanderthal brain. Right? However, you have to, in your frontal lobes, fight your rear lobe or whatever the heck it is, your lizard brain back there. It's a battle. Your frontal lobes, you say, hey, I know I have unlimited food and I don't have to go hunt mammoth tomorrow. I, I won't starve. So I have to override my genetic programming and my Darwinistic inklings or, or, or um, predispositions. And I have to force myself to go and do interesting things. Yes, it would be nice, and you know I'm, I'm guilty as charged. Uh, uh, like every time, not <clears throat> once, every time I'm about to go on one of my adventures, my brain is kind of like, gosh, you know what? What if we just sat and God, you know, we, we could get hit by a deer or something like that, and uh, I don't know. I have to force myself to go through it, it and it's and it's sad to sound like that, but yeah, you, there's always going to be a question. There's always a, would it be nice to stay at home and play video games? Yes, but for now. You must not waste your life. You must go. You cannot be tired. You cannot say, I'm going to procrastinate. You cannot say, I want to go. You must go and do it, whatever that adventure or, or um, exercise is. So uh, fight that because in the end, nothing's really stopping you in the Western world. Nothing really is. It's just you, and that is where the majority of people uh, uh, fail to capitalize on a truly free mind. So finally, I leave you with this quote. Follow the wise words of Butch Cassidy from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where he said, Kid, the next time I say let's go someplace like Bolivia, let's go someplace like Bolivia. And that is the end. Uh, if you would, I have two books out there. Enjoy the Decline. Um, that one basically is how to enjoy the decline. And as you see the subtitle, Accepting and Living with the Death of the United States. It is a shocking title, but uh, it's turning out, I think, to be my most popular book. There's also Worthless, The Young Person's Indispensable Guide to Choosing the Right Major. That's uh, for you if you have kids that are about to go to college or in college. Or if you yourself have to be a young one or need some guidance on um, how not to basically piss away 75 grand of your money and four years of your life. Uh, you could also visit my website, captaincapitalism.blogspot.com, where I blog and podcast and uh, YouTube regularly. And that's it. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much.